On this episode of Upcoming Attractions, we got trailers for Obi-Wan and Miss Marvel, plus our film discussions for West Side Story, The Atom Project, and Turning Red. All this and more on Upcoming Attractions. G'day gang, we're back for another episode of Upcoming Attractions. With me as always is my co-host, Adrienne. Hey everyone, how's it going Matt? I'm good. And also our other guest, Casper. <laughs> no, it's, in, it's <laughs> a miserable person good. right next to me. No, nah, it's just voice. us two together. It's just <laughs> us two today. Um, and it should be good. How, how you been, homie? I've been, I've been quite well. I've been trying to smash out as many movies as I can in the evenings after work. Because, I mean, it's usually what I do anyway. But I have been working extra hard this last two weeks. But I'm getting there. I'm still, still, you know, rolling with the movies. What about you? Yeah, yeah. I've, um, oh man, I've been going hard editing this <laughs> podcast for TikTok. I, yeah. we, 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 for those who haven't really been paying attention, um, we were kind of late on an episode, and our schedule's been all over the place. But we're back on schedule, and we're we're rock and rolling. The and TikTok is is the place to be. It really is. It's it's great, and um, I think we're finally getting back on the algorithm's good side. Um, um, we had this period where our views were just dying, but they're picking up again, which is nice. I've been experimenting with our hashtag game. It's it's weird. I keep hearing conflicting opinions <laughs> from all these social media gurus, and I just it's come to my attention that none of them know what they're talking about. Yeah. I don't think anyone understands TikTok. It's just a <laughs> magical, mythical realm thing, and no one understands how it works. So who knows? That seems to be the general consensus to me is it's honestly just random. Yeah. Like everybody's strategy seems to work only for them. Yeah. <laughs> like other people try other things and yeah. But look, uh, the last uh, few weeks and I think next week too, uh, very quiet in the cinema. But mm. they've picked up on streaming. A lot of stuff's hitting streaming now. Um, I'm really excited, though, for the 31st because we're getting Sonic and Morbius in the same day. Yes. I'm going to see them both back to back, and I'm really oh, excited to do that episode. That's a great idea. If I, if I can, I will so do that. Well, I don't know if I'll see them back to back on the same day, but maybe the same <laughs> week. But we'll okay. see. We'll see. Um, but we've got to go see Morbius together because we have a bet. Mm-hmm. So a reminder about our bet, everyone. If yep. it gets, I believe, uh, below 60%, <laughs> AD and Jesse buy me dinner. But if it's over 60%, uh, I owe them dinner. And um, I feel like I might win this bet. I, Look, I'm feeling, I'm feeling more, I like the latest trailer. I think it's the best trailer they had yet. Ooh. But, but I still Shake think I'm going to win it. Boots. I'm, I'm hearing, I'm hearing um, apparently... There's some te- apparently there are some test screenings that didn't go great, but those are from like sources I don't trust. So okay. I don't, well, and then I think I read a leak, a plot leak on Reddit, but it it sounded wrong to me. Um, okay. Do you search it, for these plot leaks, or do they just pop up and then you decide to to read them? Sometimes I do. Um, okay. Sometimes I don't. But uh, the other day I, I read like a tweet and I was saying. I've read the Morbius plot leak. It's terrible. It sounds like a nightmare. And then I was like, oh God, I have to find it now. So I read it and look, it doesn't sound bad. It sounds, it's kind of like Venom one, just it's generic, like sort of average sort of story okay. structure. Pretty, but like the, the, apparently the cameos and the way they worded it, some parts, it makes it sound like it takes place before Spider-Man No Way Home. But this leak yeah. apparently came out before that movie came out. So now I feel like it was just fake. Okay, so there's there's actually a good chance that it might just be total bullshit. Yeah. No. More like, than the um, dinner, more than the dinner, I just really want you to be proven wrong. <laughs> that's that's what yep. I want. Like most people in life, people want me to be wrong. But that I have this terrible habit dessert. of being right. I have this terrible habit of being right. I'm pretty good you at it. You actually are really good at it sometimes. And then like specifically accurate with so many things, but I just want you to I don't know. I just love Jared. I love vampires. I hope that it goes really well. Jar- Jared is uh, a cool actor. and But I'll yeah. be honest, with this one, like, I feel like it could go either way. Like, I'm really surprised at how nice critics have been to 
the last two Venom movies. Like it's and you even liked audiences. You the second like, one though. Like, sorry. Was the second one sort of like well received by critics? Um, I think so. Like some critics were say it's very divisive, but some okay. people were saying the people who like the comedy in it. Yeah. which I think is cringy as fuck. But the people who <laughs> like it say that they love, they doubled down on it. They, they, they doubled down on it in yeah. Let There Be Carnage. But for me, it's like you've wasted one of Spider-Man's best villains. Like I hate how they treat. He was accurate technically, yeah. but like he, they killed him off straight away. He had barely any interaction with Venom throughout the whole movie. So weird. Okay, we got to shut up. Well, this is going to become a Venom podcast. So. <laughs> So let's move on to some trailers, shall we? We shall. All right. So let's jump in to the latest Star Wars show, Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, with our boy Ewan McGregor back in the back in the robes. Uh, before we get into this, AD, what is how have you been receiving the the Star Wars shows since Disney Plus? Have you seen many of them? Um, um... what have you thought so far? Where are you I at? I still am catching up with Mandalorian, which for me is my favorite all time anything from Star Wars. I think it's perfect, and I don't know. Like I was pretty obsessed with it when it dropped. I watched the first season twice, and now I just have to finish the second one and like catch up. But <laughs> I did see the first season twice, and then don't finish the second one I, because I was waiting for the second one, and then I was like, oh, okay. oh I'll watch okay. it again. But um, it was okay, so, <laughs> so good. And there's so many other ones, though. And I feel like the way that you guys received Boba Fett made me less inclined to watch it. So I don't know if after I finish Mandalorian, I will jump into it. Do you think it's necessary for this one or not? Uh, for, for Obi-Wan, yeah. no. But okay. for Mando Season 3, yeah. there is... It'd be good if you watched the last maybe two or three episodes of Boba okay. Fett, just because it's so weird. Because it at the end of season two, Grogu is separated, or Baby Yoda, whatever you want to call him, he's separated from Mando, mm-hmm. and then during Boba Fett, they come back together. Oh, okay, so that's a pretty lot of, significant. Yeah, and it's like it just makes you wonder, and it's the, and those are the best episodes of the whole show, and it also makes mm. you wonder like why didn't you save this for season three? Like, I remember you saying that. So, it, it's such a bizarre choice, but but Obi Wan Kenobi um, is a different part of the Star Wars timeline, I believe. Uh, Mando and Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett take place after Return of the Jedi and before The Force Awakens. Obi-Wan Kenobi takes place between the prequels and the original trilogy. Uh, okay, so, okay. so this is the time period. Um, it's while Obi-Wan's basically it's while Ewan McGregor is becoming, um, oh, what's the other actor's name? I forget his name, but, but it's, it's while he's getting oldest and while he's on Tatooine, he's supervising Luke. So you get that shot where, okay. He's looking at the kid playing. Yeah. That's supposed to be Luke Skywalker. Yes. And this is supposedly, it's hard to tell how long it takes place, Like, but well, it's going to be his time in Tatooine alone. The Jedi Order has fallen. He believes he's the last Jedi or one of the last Jedi. And you'll notice in this trailer, there are these um, people dressed in black and they are in the expanded universe called the Inquisitors. They right. are... I've heard of them, but I don't know much about it. I knew, though, that you would because yeah. there's... So... Look, you're an encyc- a Star Wars encyclopedia. <laughs> and Thank you. <laughs> you're so welcome. <laughs> yeah. So so they're basically, from my understanding, like, I'm not super deep in the expanded universe, but I think they're technically not counted as Sith because of, okay. I don't know, some legal technicality but what they Me, are a legal technicality I, I don't know like they they have some excuse because supposedly there's only allowed to be two sith at a time a master and an apprentice okay um but then they i guess while making a star wars show they needed ways to come up with more lightsaber battles so <laughs> yes that would make yeah so it's much it's, sense. it's it's basically for plot reasons so the inquisitors <laughs> are like a force um that are trained to kill Jedi 
but they also have lightsabers. I don't know. And they also have force powers. So I don't know what makes them any different, but they're in the video games. They're in the comics, but this is the first time we, they're in the cartoons. It's the first time we see them in live action. That's really cool. Yeah. So their, their job is find the Jedi and kill them. And I, I could be wrong. They might be trained by Darth Vader. I'm not sure. Uh, and so somehow for this to fit within the sh- timeline, I guess if they find Obi-Wan, he's going to somehow kill them or stop them from telling anyone else where he is. Because okay. in New Hope, Darth Vader did not know Obi-Wan was on Tatooine. So oh. some shit's got to happen. But we also know that Hayden Christian is returning as Anakin. Yes, I saw that when I looked at the cast list uh, yeah. just to make sure. So we're going to get a – oh, this is going to be great. We're going to get the rematch. Um, okay. Oh, which my is gonna God. Which is going to be great. This is going to be massive. I My expectations for this, even though I'm not like a tattoo, you know, a lightsaber on my forehead level fan <laughs> – I think this is going to be a 20 out of 10 mini series. And I'm really, when I saw Joel Edgerton, I was so excited. So I was like, Western Sydney represent. Woo woo. <laughs> yes. I love him. I love anything he does. And I think he'll suit this so well. And then your fave, Kamal Nanjiani is in it too. So he's really killing it. Wait, is he in the trailer? I, he's not Did in the I trailer. Oh, okay. I, well, I didn't see him, but he's in the cast list. And I actually didn't know that, so I'm I'm really oh, excited. I there's no... a there's a question mark next to his character's name, so we don't even know who he's going to be. I will be so mad, <laughs> and I, I'm willing to bet you oh, there's no. a high chance of this happening. I'll uh-huh. be mad if he's voice only because he's he's known for doing a lot of because he's got such a unique yeah, voice. Yeah, he does. He's done a lot of voice acting roles, but like he's all ripped now from doing Eternals, and I want that to be worth something. I hope he gets a lightsaber. I hope he's like an Inquisitor or someone who fights Obi-Wan. In Eternals, he wasn't so. really showing off his riptedness that much though, was he? I think he had... Wait, did he have a... No, he didn't. He didn't. Um, so what if, what if, Matt, hear me out. This is for this show. Yeah. What if that's what that's for? So he, he wouldn't was actually do that training for a voice for Star Wars. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe, maybe. Um... I think Disney are really happy with him with him right now. Like, who like wouldn't be him? happy with him? He would oh, be the yeah. guy who would come on as a casual, and you'd be like, "Please, for the love of God, like, stay full time. Like, we need yes. you." Yes, yeah. Disney are like that. <laughs> like, you'll notice, like, um, when they like someone, they mm. keep working with them. Like, they and they they pop up a lot. Like Lin Mar- uh, Lin Manuel Miranda. Mm. It's like every Disney like animated project yeah. or anything to do with singing. He's the first guy they hire. Um, yeah. John Favreau and oh, what's his name? Is it Greg? Uh, there's another guy. Those two pretty much shepherd Star Wars now. Yeah. More yeah. than Kathleen Kennedy. Um, and and yeah, so like. Well, Kathleen cool. Kennedy is one of the executive producers on Obi Wan Kenobi. Yeah, Kathleen Kennedy is interesting. She she's basically. She's pretty much executive producer on everything Star Wars since Disney bought him. I don't yeah. know much about her background. I don't know if she came with Lucasfilm, but basically she shepherded a lot of stuff. And so when things go bad in Star Wars, a lot of people shift the blame to her. Oh, like, kind of like how the nuts. sequel trilogy yeah. didn't work out so much. But weirdly enough, like no one gives her credit for how good the show is. I was going to say, like, I'm sure that. It, when it's, you know, when it rains, it pours. But when it goes really well, no one's really like, oh, congrats. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's because really at the end of the day, people look at Marvel and they've, they just, they, you can tell like they know their destination. They are working towards it. It's so smooth. They've got everything planned out and no other studio can seem to do that. Like mm. we've seen DC fuck, like shoot themselves in the foot over and over <laughs> so again. So many times. Um, like even more than the, the foot they're shooting themselves in the knee like just the foot the <laughs> knee the... i saw someone the other day make a comment and they're like what they should do is make the snyder cut canon and then make the sequel to justice league directed by james gunn and i'm mm. i was looking at that like yeah okay dc fans love james gunn they love uh zach snyder 
but James Gunn is like the exact opposite of Zack Snyder. <laughs> like, Maybe that's watch- why it could work. Yeah, but it's like, it would be such a weird tone shift from going, you know, a sad emo Superman um, yeah. to a Superman going, hey, dick joke, dick <laughs> joke. <laughs> you know? Hey, dick joke. Love yeah. that. I'd watch that. Um, I was yeah, really going to... I was going to quickly say as well, so I'm looking at the cast list and there's a bunch of people with question marks next to their name, two of which are Ice Cube and his son. Is it his son? (sighs) Whoa. Yeah, O'Shea Um, Jackson? Yeah. Yeah, they're both, they have no, yeah, they've got no uh, character names next to them. So that's interesting. His, his, that's the thing because Disney... They're so protective and secretive of the Star Wars shows. Like they have such amazing directors and you won't know who directed it till the credits roll. So like yeah. you'd be watching an episode, like this is really great. And then the credits come up directed by Taika Waititi or um, Robert Rodriguez. Yeah, and but, you're like, what? what? Yeah, it's, so it's, true. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun to like check who directed what. Like actually out of, um, from this one episode in Boba Fett, the Mandalorian based one, Everyone's now saying Bryce Dallas Howard, like, is should be directing like the biggest Star Wars movies because she's now I think two for two with some of the best episodes yet. Um, but dude, Ice Cube in Star Wars, I know, I love that. Again, like with Star Wars, I feel like what makes a great character is um, a lot of the vocal and voices and stuff. Yes, like a lot of the best Star Wars characters, you can impersonate them, like from. Yoda to yeah uh, to, to like um, yes master with like one with the prequels or mm. um, it's always the voices huge, that yeah a huge part of it yeah and he again Kamal Nanjiani and Ice Cube both really recognizable and amazing voices yeah even um, um oh, the fact that, that his min- the fact that his son though is in it either means that they're going to be acting alongside each other or. He's going to Probably. be playing someone and then his son's going to come in and play him in a flashback. Mm. So, mm, interesting. Yeah, I think, I don't know if they've ever acted alongside each other in any movies. I don't, I don't think, they have. think they have. I don't. Yeah. I know his son's played him, but yeah. that's probably the closest to it. Yeah. All right, cool. Are you um, excited sh- for it though? Just real quick. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Look, actually, I will say I've got one concern about the Obi Wan show. Okay, I don't, I don't think this will be a problem, but it's it's a possibility. Mm-hmm. I'm really sick of Tatooine. I'm so sick of seeing all of Boba Fett. Almost all of Boba Fett took place in Tatooine. <laughs> a large amount of the Mandalorian seasons one and two took place in Tatooine. Um, the Force Awakens doesn't play taste doesn't take place in Tatooine, but it pla- takes place on a planet that's so similar to Tatooine, it may as well be Tatooine. <laughs> and maybe, I know I maybe. know it's like the most iconic planet, but I'm just so sick of seeing deserts. Like I've already seen Dune this year. Yeah. Um, maybe they don't new locations over there, you know? Like maybe it's cheaper for them to, to film on that oh, planet. Oh, probably. They're just um. reusing the same sets <laughs> over and over. Disney's trying to, you know, Mickey Mouse is trying to save them dollars, but... Oh I'm just God. so sick because the one of the best things about Star Wars is meeting all these interesting new aliens and planets. Mm. And like one of the best things about Rogue One was that we saw a tropical planet. We'd never seen that before, you know? Yeah, and, that's um, so true. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe, hopefully the entire thing then isn't exactly the same. Yeah, th- there's one shot um, where it looks like it could be I know it's got a lot of neon lights. It looks like it could be Japanese inspired, but I don't know. Is that a scene? Is that an episode? Is that a place we're going to be going back to? I'm going to laugh so hard if like one day you finally, like when you are finally where you want to be as a director and you get given, you get given some epic show. I hope it's a 40 episode long season set there just to piss you off. That would be the funniest thing <laughs> We're directing Tatooine the series. <laughs> series. It's, it's it's about a space camel that walks through the desert for forty episodes, forty days, and forty nights. <laughs> oh my god! Gee, I'll be an intern for free just to watch that. Yeah. That would be one of the best things ever. <laughs> Fucking space camels. 
Uh, but look, last thing I'll say, um, the thing that makes this interesting is all the st- both Star Wars shows we have so far were about two characters that are very similar. They were very similar helmets. Mm. They, you know, they were very similar characters doing ver- in very similar locations sometimes. This is our first one starring a Jedi. Um, mm. We're going to have different types of combat. Um, maybe different types of lore. Uh, and it's going to have the most impact on the Star Wars universe, Star Wars timeline, because Obi-Wan is one of the most important characters to the entire franchise. So, And Darth Vader is going to be in it. Like, holy shit. Any, yeah. any scene with Darth Vader would be amazing. I'll say this. Um, when Disney first bought Star Wars... Mm. Um, Marvel started releasing these awesome new Star Wars comics and they use the likeness of like the real actors and it took okay. place between episodes four and five. And I haven't been a comic guy in years, but I religiously started buying them and it was so yeah. interesting. And they touched on all these story plot points that you wouldn't think of that of course had to have happened between four mm. and episodes four and five. And they maybe could have do this. Like there was this one episode, there's one point where, um, like Darth Vader discovers he has a son. Like he doesn't know, like when he's like, Luke, I am your father between episodes three and six, oh, sorry, it's three and five. There's no way for you to know, like how did Darth Vader know Luke Skywalker was yeah. his son? Yeah. Um, and the way in the comics he finds out is uh, Boba Fett is tasked by Darth Vader to find, they knew, and he knew a Jedi was involved Um in blowing up the Death Star, but he didn't know who it is because, mm. you know, there's no scene in episode four with Darth Vader yeah. and Luke Skywalker shake hands. Her, nice to meet you. I'm Darth Vader, <laughs> you know? And so he tasks him. Boba Fett fights Luke, but he doesn't know how to use a lightsaber properly yet. And so he loses. And then he gets away. And then Bob is like, oh, Darth Vader. I found out his name. His name is Luke Skywalker. And he's like, oh, thank you. And he looks out. Oh, he's like, thank you. <laughs> so I have a son. Like, he did because he didn't know his his son and daughter were bought, like survived the birth or anything. He never. Really I you know what I want? There. I yeah. want the rom com of the story of this romance. <laughs> to, like, I don't want to see how this happened because I it's inconceivable in my head that Darth Vader could be affectionate to any point. <sighs> well, the closest thing we have to that is Star Wars Episode Two, and uh, that movie's fucking trash. So. <laughs> Not Attack the of the Clones, I, I hate it. Like As much as people shit on the sequels, Attack of the Clones is unwatchable to me. So, wow. so fuck that. Uh, but anyways, look, let's move on because we're, we're, we're doing terrible for time. Um, <laughs> and we spent way too long on that. Uh, Miss Marvel. Marvel Studios, Miss hmm. Marvel. Um, what, do you, what do you think of this trailer? Um, I thought it looks really, really fun. And it was not something that I was expecting to have on my radar at all. And I think I remembered reading about it and then I saw like a teaser poster or something. And, but I had never really heard of anything to do with it. I mean, the lead actress is also like a fully new. This is her first thing she's ever done. And she looks so amazing. She just fits the bill. She sort of gives me um, like a, that sort of um, Deadpool-y vibes, like the the chill, funny, sort of no filter. I don't know. You know what this actress uh, gives me vibes of? What? Haley Steinfeld. That yeah yeah Haley Steinfeld. Like, I, She's like the look, PG Deadpool. Yeah, yeah. Like, those two girls just have the same energy to me, and like that's awesome. One, I, I like Haley Steinfeld and Hawkeye. One hundred percent. I fully agree with you, and I'm <laughs> so here for this. What were your thoughts? Did you know about it? Like, did you know much about it? Um, um of course I knew a lot about it because okay. it's me. I know yes. a lot. Um. I, I, um, but look, Miss Marvel as a character, I'm, I don't know a lot. The interesting okay. thing about Miss Marvel is she's a very new character in the comics. She's okay. Technically, uh, this version of her, Kamala Khan, her name is, is less than 10 years old. Um, oh, the, I wasn't sure if she had been around for like decades or. The moniker of Miss Marvel has technically been around for decades. But was it was first there was like I think it was like a it was like Mr. Marvel or Marvel Man or some shit and then 
a bunch of you know it's not really important basically there were mm. other versions of his character and none of them were very particularly interesting but then um i think it was in 2014 or something like less than 10 years ago um they created this character kamala khan to be i think it's marvel's first muslim superhero that's what and, i got the vibes of so yeah. yeah and what's interesting about her is She's a character that is really new in the comics, but the fans took to her straight away. Uh, okay. I remember when the comics were coming out and I remember reading online and stuff, people were saying that she really reminded them of like the the glory days of Spider-Man comics. Like yeah. the, the fact that she's so young and she's got all these like real world problems. And a lot of people, I just remember people saying like, this reminds me of like the first time I got into reading Spider-Man. You know? Oh, that's really and, nice. Yeah, and I think just at the time they just had some really good writers working on her comics. Um, okay. Since then, though, I haven't seen her in much except uh, about a year, year or two ago. Was it a year ago or two? I don't know. A year or two ago, there was this new Avengers game which got yeah. bombed by critics, but she was kind of the main character and I, I loved her character in that. She's... She writes Avengers fan fiction. She That's idolizes so cool. the Avengers. And then during, thanks to an accident, she becomes a superhero herself. And that's uh, that comes to like the one criticism. The, the nerds are getting mad because they've changed her powers for this show. Um, yeah. But her, her powers are supposed to be, she's a polymorph. She's kind of like Mr. Fantastic. She can stretch her arms and stuff but she can also grow in size or her signature move is she makes her fist like really big and then like she punches you with it. Yeah. Um, but in here, it's sort of like she's got, I think, a bracelet or something and it's like light, which projects the motion of what she's trying to do. But it looks like there may be some other abilities as well. Uh, but to all those fans who are complaining about her changing her powers... Uh, mm. My question to you is, did you read the comic? And if the answer is no, then shut the fuck up. Like, <laughs> like, well, I did not like, read the comic. This is and not new. I, yeah. <laughs> like, this is not new. Get this. Here's a fun fact. You know Superman? Yes. You know how kryptonite is, like, really important to his character? Yeah. That didn't come from the comics. It came from a radio play because they were no – It just came way. from a radio play. Yeah. Um, cool. Ha- Harley Quinn, one of the most popular characters from Batman, she did not come from the comics. She came from a kid's cartoon show. Uh, So these changes are not a bad thing, especially since it's very early into the history of this character. This character is less than 10 years old. And um, yeah, like there's some, there's some theories that they, they change the powers. So when they do the Fantastic Four movie, people don't get her powers confused with, Mr. Fantastic. I don't know. Yeah. I'm sure. I just hope that there's a good story reason for it. I'm uh, sure there will be. The, yeah. I don't know. This The trailer packed such a punch for me. I was hooked for every second of it. And I think there's going to be so many new characters that everyone's going to fall in love with and become obsessed with too. Yeah. Like what's, a, what's amazing about Marvel is that they can do different genres within superheroes. And it's crazy yeah. to think we've got this like coming of age uh, this coming of age type film, high school film, coming right after Moon Knight, which is apparently one of the darkest and grittiest Marvel shows, uh, movies, shows ever made. So that variety is really nice. And I love this coming of age vibe, you know, Diary of the Wimpy Kid, the drawings and stuff. We'll, we'll talk about that more later when we talk about Turning Red, because that also does that. But it's just nice to have some variety. It's nice to have something different. So yeah, yeah I'm really I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so keen. I'll probably yeah. binge it. Oh, they'll probably release it weekly, won't they? Yeah, yeah, they will. Damn it. Um, <laughs> the, the only <laughs> things I have is uh, one. Um, I don't know if she's known for having many particularly interesting villains. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. So I don't know what they're going to do, bad guy wise, and. The one thing is, so she's an Avengers fangirl in the comics and her biggest, like, favorite superhero is Captain Marvel. That's why she calls herself, I think, Miss Marvel because 
the relationship there. But in the MCU currently, nobody knows who Captain Marvel is. She's been to Earth like for 10 minutes and that's it. And in this trailer, she's clearly a hardcore fan of Captain Marvel. She's got mm. like drawings of her everywhere. So I wonder how they're going to introduce Kamala knowing who Captain Marvel is. Uh, my theory is, here's my theory. The opening of the first episode is going to be like the opening of Hawkeye. Like somehow okay. Captain Marvel saves her from something. I don't know. Thanos is trying to kill her and Captain Marvel swoops in or something's going to happen. Like something's going to happen to make her character inspired by Captain Marvel. Yeah, so, I could see that happening for sure. It's got to be, there's got to be a catalyst in that that yeah. thing that makes her so die hard. Yeah, so that'll be very interesting to see. Um, but yeah, if I'm looking carefully to at the trailer, it looks like on her t-shirt, she the t-shirt's got Captain Marvel. Um, I think it's Haley Steinwald's Hawkeye, and then it's the Wasp. So it's the three main female. Right superheroes okay um maybe she's a culmination of all of them like maybe well it'd be interesting all... to see if they share a scene together because none yeah. of those characters have met each other i think no no they haven't um, that's correct i think captain marvel and the wasp have been in the same room during that one scene at endgame but yeah they haven't spoken not interacted yeah. that is true yeah anyways though Looking forward to the show. Looks amazing. Uh, shall we move on? We shall. Woo! Spoiler alert. The following film discussions will contain spoilers. We're talking The Adam Project, West Side Story, and Turning Red. If you don't want to be spoiled, check the description and the time codes below. This is your spoiler warning. You've been warned. Okay, and we're back. Let's kick off with Netflix's The Adam Project, starring Ryan Reynolds. Eddie, what'd you what'd you think of this one? I loved The Adam Project. I had heard about it, like seen the trailer and stuff, and then I sort of it sort of like fell off my radar. And then everyone at home one night was like, "Oh, what's this?" And we put it on, and then we were all just glued and hooked the entire time. That was actually a film that I would have paid to go see in the cinema personally. Oh, for sure. Um, I loved the cast. It was um, it was just unreal watching Walker Scoble play a young Ryan Reynolds because he nailed him to a T. Uh, the fact that this is his first film as well is beyond impressive. And I love those videos that they post together where he's like reciting Deadpool um, because he's such and like is, has always been a fan. He sort of manifested this into real life, I think, which is awesome. Um, and it was sweet seeing Mark Ruffalo in it as well. I love Jennifer Garner, and I thought the action was great, but the comedy was my favorite element. So, what about you? Um, yeah, like this movie was a lot of fun. Um, I think what really makes this film work. And I don't think it's a perfect film by any means. Mm. Um, but I, I think what really makes this film work is we've seen Ryan Reynolds do his do his thing a lot. Yes. But what's what's fun and what really works with his chemistry in this one is he's got a character who's also playing Ryan Reynolds um, himself. So the banter is kind of like Ryan Reynolds versus Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. And which is funny and it's fun to say, but what they've done, which makes it go a step further is underneath all that, there's an extra um, layer of, of, of character work where he's looking back on himself and realizing I've been a dick. I've been a, a shitty person. And yeah. there's like a lot of regret in, in that. There so, was a lot of emotion and a lot of deep themes as well with his character. Which is surprising. Cause I know going into this film, I know Netflix really pushed hard with the promotion on this one. But I was just like, ah, oh, Ryan Reynolds with a little kid. It's going to be this crappy, family-friendly children's <laughs> yeah. show. And it really, really wasn't. It was um, a really fun, adventure globe globetrotting adventure. Um, 
I thought Mark Ruffalo was particularly good. Honestly, mm-hmm. maybe one of my favorite Mark Ruffalo performances, to be honest. Um, Ooh, okay. But to be fair, I haven't seen him in a lot. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah. I, thought, I thought he was great. Um, are you familiar with the director for this film, maybe? Yeah, Sean Levy. Um, he's amazing. I think the first of when I was younger, like Night at the Museum, I was obsessed with those. And they were probably the first films where I I looked him up specifically because I wanted to know who was responsible for being so amazing. Um, he could direct musicals. He's just got that, I don't know, like the he's amazing with pacing and dialogue um, and his oh. choreography is is really good too. I think that he's he must be the funnest guy because – <laughs> everything from just married to pink panther which i've seen like 40 times um and up until now like even with arrival everything he does is just so cohesive and i don't know i love him i think he's he, amazing if you see him in interviews he's clearly a very fun guy um, yeah but look uh, i'm just gonna list off some of the movies he's made not mm-hmm. all of them but just just some of them that um point out to me um, Sean Levy's done Cheaper by the Dozen, mm-hmm. Pink Panther, all three Night at the Museums, uh, one, two, and three. He did Date Night, Real Steel, which is an underrated gem, if you ask me. Uh, the Internship, which I know a lot of people love. Mm-hmm. Um, he did Free Guy and Adam Project, uh, both with Ryan Reynolds. And he's just been announced to do Deadpool 3 with Ryan Reynolds. Yes, that's correct. And he's also directed a lot of episodes of Stranger Things. So yeah. This guy is like the go-to director for really well-written family comedy, uh, family adventure type films. Um, he's great, obviously, with working with kids and special effects. And um, still like, you know, those type of movies, like they're sort of made for kids, but adults can enjoy him too. Yeah. He's like the king of that. He and uh, he's really like shown it again in The Adam Project. And after doing this and Free Guy, back to back i'm really excited for deadpool 3 and especially since what really took me by surprise with this film is that there are a handful of like fight scenes and the choreography and camera movement is amazingly well done like this guy could do a john wick film and nail it like oh my god absolutely i when, when that first fight scene happens um where ryan has help from zoe saldana I, it was like more than 45 minutes in the film. So it came out of nowhere for me, but holy shit, like the way the <laughs> camera was moving and the, the choreography. And I couldn't tell if it was Ryan or a stunt double or CG, I think, because the movement was just so good. It was amazing. And then it comes together in the big Star wars type fight at the end. It was, it blew me away. Um, Do you want to know something random? Yeah. He was originally supposed to direct Uncharted. No. Yeah. Dude, that movie would have been so much better if he directed I it. I know. I know. I just He think, would have been a oh. perfect director for Uncharted. His style, like the type of films he does and his style would have suited right? that type of film he would have, so well. He would have nailed it. And he was also originally oh. supposed to, they were doing like a Minecraft movie and he was attached to that as well. <laughs> anything, anything, yeah, like um, that appeals to adults and kids, adventure, heart, comedy, the whole shebang. He's just perfect. Also, I just I have to mention, any photo you see of him, his smile is like <laughs> the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. He just Aww. looks so happy. That's I really nice. want to meet him. <laughs> like, I think he'd be amazing. He'd be amazing. Um, I wouldn't be surprised that Minecraft movie turned into Free Guy because I feel like there's a, a little yeah. bit of Minecraft influence in there. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Um, um, he nailed Adam Project. I really liked it. And oh, I'll watch anything that he does. Yeah. There's some really great performances in this. Um, if I had to come up with any criticisms, the only thing I can really think of is I feel like some of the sci-fi elements were a little bit, um, I felt like placeholders, like mm-hmm. a lot of the like spaceships and the way time travel works, and blah, blah. It feels a very, like generic sci-fi like That's, i think yeah yeah i feel like the the fake lightsaber was kind of cool but other than that it's like yeah but like i feel like it's not one of those movies that wants to dive into lore and world building mm. they wanted to focus more on characters and yes. i can respect that yeah. um but if that there's a sequel I'd, 
that's what I want them to improve on. I'd say. Yeah, for sure. That would have been the, like for me, even though it is a sci-fi film, technically, I yeah. that wasn't what was the, the anchor for me being so gripped into the story. So that's yeah. a very good point. And I think, but yeah, I think you're right. Like that's, that wasn't supposed to be the anchor. So yeah. it makes sense. It was just, how do we get Ryan Reynolds to talk to a younger <laughs> version of self? Don't worry about the logic or the details or anything. Just we'll fill it in later. Uh, um, yeah, th- this look, this movie was great. Short, here's a fun fact. I only saw Night in the Museum for the first time about maybe three or four months ago. Excuse um, me? I, I what? watched So I watched Free Guy and then the next day I watched Night in the Museum not knowing it was the same director. Ah, and then interesting. It was just a coincidence. I'm like, oh, no way. And then I watched the other two. I watched them like one night after another, three in a row. They're so and good. Like, Kate was just like, how have you not seen them? Like everybody loves those movies. Yeah. I, I saw know, all of them in the cinema. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah, glad and like seen he's just very quickly uh, just like, oh, I've been sleeping on this guy. This guy is a amazing director, and I- I'm glad that studios have directors like him to turn to because there's a lot of people out there making studio films that are pretty not well done. Yeah, but this guy, oh, bellissimo. <laughs> Uh, speaking of good directors, shall we talk about the new Spielberg film? Yes, we uh, shall. So West Side Story. Um, what did you think of West Side Story? I loved West Side Story. I am a huge musical fan. And to hear that Spielberg was going to do this, I was beyond excited and not disappointed um, I loved the way that, so with the original in the sixties, it it's back then it was sort of like musical stage sets being filmed. And that's sort of like the feeling. Um, this one was like straight nitty gritty in the streets. Um, and the city was a huge character in itself. And you felt that and its presence throughout the whole film, And I know that you also loved the production design. It was stupidly beautiful and extravagant. Um, This is nominated for Best Production Design at the Oscars, right? I assume so. Let's just double check that because if it's not... We keep talking, I'll check it. Yeah, if it's not, I'll be very upset. But absolutely loved it. I loved the costumes were phenomenal. It literally felt like he basically ripped out a movie from the 60s made it now except there just wasn't like film grain on it like everything felt like <laughs> it could have been straight out of that era uh the cast was the next hugely amazing thing i w- i loved um mostly ariana debose who is nominated for best supporting actress she was so oh she was a heartbreaking in this film but just so beautiful and her dancing um the america number was amazing i know that a lot of people sort of aren't fans of it always in the original one but this one apparently yeah that's that's one of the most memorable songs that i I know of absolutely and in this one i think it's because in the original they have like fight dance choreography in it um and so it, it might seem a bit cheese or something but Spielberg apparently used actual, like he took out some of the original choreography and kept it in this one, which I thought was really nice. But that for me was the most breathtaking number in the, in the whole film. And her yellow dress was just stunning. Everything was amazing. Choreography. Wow. Steven, just don't ever take a chill pill because you're (laughs) so good at everything that you do. A literal God in human form. Um, And I I, liked I just want to let you know, I can confirm um, West Side Story has been nominated not just for Best Production Design, but Mm -hmm. also Best Costume Design. And I'm sure there are others too, but um, you mentioned those, so I checked them up. Yes. Um, Rachel Zegler did not get a nod for Best Actress. I think that that's kind of fair. Like she's, she's amazing in it. But the other actresses nominated this year, I think, do deserve their, their places more so. 
I'm excited to see her do more things though because she does have a beautiful voice and a beautiful state uh, screen presence. I think the only person that I didn't really connect to as deeply was Ansel Elgort. Um, I think his voice is stunning, but I felt like something was missing, maybe something in their chemistry a little bit. But from her, I feel like she sort of was giving the 80% of the the chemistry and he was giving like that other little bit. Maybe he was just trying to mm. downplay the character a little bit, but that's how I felt. Um, and yeah, otherwise I cried. I loved it. I know that it's different for you, but I actually didn't feel like it was an almost like a three hour film because I was just sucked in. And I'm also a sucker for it's, it's a Romeo and Juliet adaptation um, at the oh, heart of it. Yeah. So it's pretty obvious. Um, I did have a friend of mine tell me that she hated it um, because like, dude, you've known each other for one day. Like, where's this all coming from? But that's, if you're a sucker that's for musicals. that, it's that's, musicals, that's theater. it's Theater's theater, like that. and that's Romeo and Juliet. Like, if you love that, th- th- it's the same thing. Like, um, so I really, really enjoyed it. I would probably give it a nine out of 10. And I do think that it holds its own. It does not try to outshine or downplay the original or try to recreate it. It's um, the themes as well are still extremely relevant today too. So I think that that's, um, part of the reason maybe why Spielberg wanted to bring it back. And also Rita Moreno in her 90s, uh, who won mm. the Best Actress, uh, Best Supporting Actress Oscar back in the original West Side. She is a total babe. If I can Wait, look so, like so that. she's in this and she was in the original. Yes. She also, <laughs> Steven Spielberg also made her an executive producer. He didn't want to make it unless she was on board. That's nice. Aww. Yeah. So he let Stevie. her. I know what a muffin, like a yeah. total absolute tough muffin. bloke. Yeah, Come on. he said that he um wanted to make sure that she had the ability to sort of like maybe make some changes or uh, that she felt could have been done back then. But obviously, like now we're in a completely different world of filmmaking, and so she wanted to make sure it felt more uh, inclusive and diverse as and accurate on screen than the original, yeah. which I thought was awesome. Mm. Um, so full disclosure for mm-hmm. me, um, I'm, I guess, I'm a casual fan of musicals. <laughs> like, I like musicals, but mostly musical comedies. I just yes. feel like comedy and musicals go really well together. Um, they complement each other. Serious musicals, I have a little bit of trouble trying to connect with and also musicals that focus more on dancing like i want the catchy songs i want the pop hits like so something like tick tick boom which is another oscar running musical uh that clicked with me a little bit more on a on a musical um from a musical perspective but as a film like look (laughs) i was just looking at like best director nominations and I know Spielberg has enough. He has enough Best Director <laughs> Awards. I'm sure he would he, agree. He could take it. Like this film. So I'll admit, like, I'm not the target audience for this film. I'm not a theater kid. Um, a lot of it is just not really up my alley. I, Even though I can see the amazing production design and the amazing dance numbers, I'm, I'm just not engaged with long dances with no singing i'm not the audience for that but i can acknowledge that it's incredibly well done and every second of film i'm just looking at like this must be so much money like i can see the money they spent like there's like a million extras with the most amazing costumes that Mm. each costume must cost two hundred thousand dollars like it's it's insane um but what i what i love about this film is this is classic Spielberg. Uh, everything that makes Spielberg who he is is shown through his voice on screen. And it's it's amazingly, it goes hand in hand with musicals. I just don't think I've ever seen that before. The way he yeah. directs is just a great way to also direct musicals. Who would have thought? Um, I, I'll, I'll elaborate on that, but I just think it's also, I should say it's to that point 
uh, like this is a very like old school musical. It's from the fucking fifties, right? But Spielberg's very old school director. I'm I don't know when he started directing, but it was it was probably like the seventies or sixties or something. But it's an old. But he has an old school style of directing that applies really well to this old school style musical. Um, obviously he's got all these new cameras and stuff as well, but it's a match made in heaven. So stuff that Spielberg loves to do is he loves, he, well, a lot of directors nowadays will just, um, cut, 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 a lot of fast cuts. It gives you a lot of flexibility to change the momentum. He loves to just hold the camera there really still long takes. And instead of having the camera move a lot, he has the actors move around with their blocking and it Mm. sort of has the same effect, but. It, it somehow just feels better. I can't explain it. So so long shots, wide shots, um, the long takes, lack of cuts. These are, this is very Spielberg and it yeah. just works because when you've got these big dance numbers, you need to see everything. So you need a wider shot and you don't want to interrupt the choreography. So you need the longer takes. So Spielberg, his directing style is just, a natural fit for this story. Um, And I just like, I was just watching the way he moves. It's like, damn, he's still got it, man. Spielberg is like, it's just, even though I'm not a big like musical guy, I'm looking at this film and going, this is why he's the, he's the champ. This is why he's the king. Like he's blowing my mind with it all. And I'm sure having a lot of money in your budget really helps. I don't know what the budget <laughs> for this is, but like there are some shots, like you just look at the sets and it's like, holy shit. It's and you look at some dropping. of the costumes. It's, it's actually, insane. You, you, you don't even want to blink because you might miss something like just visually. Wow. Yeah. I also, I don't know if this is up for a, a nom, but, um, and I know this is a weird compliment to give a musical, but I really did like the score, not the songs, like the songs were fine, but the score, like even in between the scenes, I thought was really, I don't know why, but it just made me think of Star Wars at times. Yeah, that's that's because John Williams. um, Is it John Williams on this? No, no, it's not. No? But so, okay, so Spielberg and John Williams always work together on all of his iconic things. Mm. Um, And I know that John Williams did Star Wars, And I think that Spielberg, so with this adaptation of West Side, he didn't change a single note. Like it's literally the exact same music, but um, he got, what's his name? Leonard Bernstein to do it. And I would not be surprised if he sort of said to him, can you give it a John Williams Mm. feeling? If that makes sense. If not, he's worked with Williams so much that his, he would have learned a thing or two from Williams and so it would have influenced his style. Oh, for sure. So, for sure. Yeah. Like either way, it's one hand washes the other. Yeah. Yeah. He is 90. Like John Williams is 90 now. So I Fuck. I know that he, I know he still composes. Like he definitely does. I think the only reason he may not have done this one is because obviously he has to be very picky and choosy. Um, he doesn't want to like run himself into the ground. Um, and yeah. He has been composing for Indiana Jones 5, which is in production mm. right now. So I don't know if he, like, just needed a break before, do, like, tackling that one. But he doesn't do it very often. So Who this knows. one might have been a lot for him to do. I don't know. It reminds me of um, Hans Zimmer famously always works with Nolan, but yeah. he didn't work on Tenet so he could do Dune. And exactly. that caused a few headlines. And it's 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 yeah. very rare to see a composer cause headlines like that. But I know, yeah. right? I love Hans. He is, he's my boy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is there anything else that you, you want to talk about with West Side Story? Anything else? No, honestly, I think um, it's, a, it's a beautifully, beautifully, it's just beautifully done in every sense. So even if like Matt, you're not that style of musical kind of person, even to watch it visually is amazing. Um, And I also sort of liked that there were no subtitles when they spoke Spanish because it makes you feel like you're actually just watching them have a real conversation. Like you don't have to understand it. And it all, it creates a barrier, which Mm. is, you know, like important 
to what they feel as well. So I noticed that and it, it took me off guard at first. I thought, are my settings wrong on Disney yeah. plus? I don't know, but no, it was, um, my sister like, thought don't... the same thing. She's yeah. like, where are the subtitles? And I'm like, there are none. <laughs> it, but it's, it makes sense. And then it actually puts more power to, in those moments, you would notice um, there'll be some characters that like speak English and then they mm. would move to English. And I thought that was, that was really interesting. So mm. um, yeah. Anyways, guys, let us know what you think in the comments and yeah. Anyways, uh, moving on to our last topic for today, uh, the latest Pixar film, Turning Red. Uh, a lot of people are saying it's Pixar's best film in years. Wow. Um, I can't. I see what they're saying. It's definitely the most fresh and refreshing film they've done in a mm. long time. But Pixar are so good that there's a lot of competition. But maybe I agree. I'm on the fence. <laughs> uh, <laughs> What did you think of Turning Red? Um, I thought it was really good. I wouldn't say it's the best in years. I think there's uh, plenty that would supersede this for me in that category. Um, I, oh my God, for the first, uh, maybe for the first half, well, the first quarter, I was dying of secondhand embarrassment from the mum. It was actually making me <laughs> yes, so uncomfortable. And I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. If this was me, I would run away from home. I would never come back. It made me so queasy. Um, <laughs> but, oh, my God, I didn't but think that that was that, going to happen. That's good storytelling. The fact that yeah. you can relate to that character, especially that early in the film, that is fantastic storytelling. It was like having some sort of regression therapy where you unlock memories that you forgot that you had. <laughs> and I was like, oh. No, I mean, not that bad, but yes. I could, there were some that I could definitely relate to. Um, yeah. I thought I loved the animation style. I really, really liked that. And the colors, um, I cannot, I'm so worried I'm going to butcher her name, but Maitreyi uh, Ramakrishnan, she's in, um, she's in that epic Netflix series called Never Have I Ever. I, I okay. could recognize her voice straight away. So I was really happy that she was in it. Um, Sandra Oh was good. Oh, I love anything she does. Sandra Oh was great, um, particularly. Yeah, and, she was um, wonderful. And and Phineas is in it as well. Finney, Finney, Phineas, yeah. uh, the guy, uh, Billy Eilish's brother slash writer and producer. Oh, no way. Okay. Yeah, super randomly. I was like looking through the cast. And I was like, that is so oh um, he's one of the four it. town guys okay. yeah he's one of the four town oh, guys which was so cool that's fun um but yeah the cast was fun and i thought that you know what i maybe the maybe just her struggle was making it too hard for me to sit and enjoy because i felt like i was personally being attacked so, <laughs> <laughs> i don't know that's it made okay. me highly uncomfortable sometimes. You know what the crazy thing is? So I don't know if you've seen this on the internet, but there's been a bit of controversy. Um, Cinema Blend, one of the biggest film review sites mm -hmm. out there, has had a controversial review that said that, that the guy said because of a lot of the Chinese references, this guy it was like, I had trouble relating to the film. It's funny that you have the opposite reactions. Like, no, I related too much. I related so much that I just want to come back. Yeah, my eyes. it literally hurt to watch sometimes. <laughs> and then, I oh. the the whole cultural. I I can just appropriate her cultural um sort of pressures to my own. And I'm sure you could too. Like, oh, dude, you, it's a movie about a person going through puberty. What's more relatable than that? Right? Honestly, honestly. And then on top of that. You've got immigrant parents who just want you to do really well. Yeah. Um, and then that you have that pressure on you and you just, you know, oh my God. Like it just felt, it literally was like a therapy session that I did not ask for. And On that topic, <laughs> yeah. before we move on, I just want to say, I know it's interesting that in recent years, Disney has really had a push for stories of Chinese protagonists. You know, we mm. had Shang-Chi and The Legend of Ten Rings. We had Raya and the Last Dragon. We Both had, um, there's one more I'm forgetting. Raya and the Last Dragon, Shang-Chi and the Legend of Ten Rings, Mulan and Mulan as well. Yes. Um, and now we've got Turning Red. And I think out of all of them, I think they're all pretty solid films, but like 
turning red is the most relatable. Um, For sure. And and yeah, just sorry that criticism really bugs me because it's like, how do you like? Did you not have a childhood? Like it's yeah. so relatable, dude. Like, come on. I don't know. I can't. Like, admittedly, though, to be honest, though, to admittedly, personally, I've never turned into a giant red panda. So yeah, maybe I can understand. That was like <laughs> the only part that I couldn't personally relate to. But I loved, I loved the animation of her friends. They were so expressive and so funny. The girl in the purple outfit who always made like the crazy faces, <laughs> she made me laugh so hard. Like anything that best. she did, she was probably my favorite. Um, uh, the, the animation style was yeah. very like anime influenced. Yes, I, I picked that like, up so much. The, like the eyes and yeah. Even when she was doing her little doodles in her book, that was basically like anime drawing style which yeah. was cool and and definitely their physicality was totally i think inspired by that um oh, what else was i gonna say there was um oh uh, the, uh, yeah. the underlying theme though you know sort of about repressing what like the bad or like her dad says we have to make room for the bad instead of trying to you know get rid of it or block it out that was that was really beautiful i really liked that I agree. I agree. Um, I think one other thing to point out is in addition to like the anime influence with the art style is the very um, coming of age sort of vibes with the, the drawings appearing on screen. And, you know, like I said, like Diary of the Wimpy Kid or even Miss Marvel's doing that now um, really helps do it. I, I, I could be wrong, but is this the, f- this might be one of the first um, Pixar films where the character keeps breaking the fourth wall and i i like that I think so yeah because um, i can't off the top of my head there are none that i can think of that do that so yeah I think like you're right. a lot of them will have narration but this i think what makes this film seem feel so fresh is uh not so much the subject matter but rather the execution of that like the the breaking of the fourth wall the the, the new art style uh, and like Pixar experiment with a lot of art styles, but this one was felt really like a departure yeah. from what they've done previously. Very and different. And so, yeah, like, is this the best Pixar film? I don't know about that, but it's the most fresh, I would say, we've had in a while. It was a nice breath of fresh, nice breath of fresh air. And um, I think it was done really well. Uh, the director of this, um, her name... Um, I hope I pronounced this right. It's Domi Shi. Mm-hmm. Uh, she directed also a Pixar short called Bow. Yeah, I was um, going to mention that one. That made me cry. Yeah, like, it was so adorable. hard. That was one of those, it's one of those shorts where afterwards the whole cinema's like, hey, I need to text my mom. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. I, like, I, I just want to say, I think she's got a really bright future ahead of her. I think mm. this is not the last we've heard from her. I, she's going to, there's like the, the critical reception of this film is incredible. And I think, you know, Bao was also. Um, she won the is, Academy is Award for her? Best Animated Short for that. And it's, it's Bao. Yeah. I did not realize that. That's amazing. So she's already. Uh, but I'm not surprised now. as well. So yeah, I, I think we'll be seeing her a lot because um, she's these projects just just knocking them out of the park. They're so amazing. So they are, and she was also she was a storyboard artist for like Inside Out and Toy Story Four as well. So I think that all of the work leading up to this, you can tell that she's had the best sorts of movies to like learn in the making process to come into her own. And I'm looking forward yeah. to whatever she makes next. Pixar have an interesting process of how they pick up projects. Like if I remember correctly, I read somewhere that um, Pixar have a policy that anyone within their company can pitch a project. Um, I don't know if this applies to like the janitors and stuff, but yeah, <laughs> uh, like as you can tell, like she was a storyboard artist for years and years. So that happens, but apparently, I remember reading after after Bao. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. I think it's Bao. It is. Bo, it's Bao. It's um, Bao. Bao. After she did Bao, Pixar came to her and they said, uh, "Come up with three ideas. You can pitch three, and one of them was turning red." That's so and, cool! Oh my god! Yeah, so, 
they were clearly very, very happy with her. But yeah, and look, yeah, Turning Red, amazing film. I'm sure they're going to sell a lot of those uh, red panda teddy bears. Oh, yeah. Um, if they're the as thing fluffy is... as she was in the movie, I will oh, buy one too. <laughs> so cuddly. Um, the only thing is, is that why didn't this get a s- cinema release? That's what crime. I was so confused about because it's it's received incredible reviews, like you've said, and it was definitely of cinema release level like that blows my mind that they just didn't do that i don't yeah. get it I've, I've seen um some people describe that there's a bit of a war going on between disney and pixar because this is the mm. third pixar film in a row that was denied a theatrical release the and was put to disney plus um the ones before that were what well, raya was do... one raya i think it was raya yeah was it raya i think it was raya and then I think that was, was the, the first one. Raya was the first, I think, that they decided to do that. Um, um for one that was definitely list? supposed to should have really strictly been cinema. Um I I'm can't... having trouble. Where's this list of uh Disney films? Pixar films. One sec. Yep. Um here we go. It was Luca. Luca. Luca, and we, and we Luca. Yes. Loved you know, it. Watched it three the, the, of times. Of course, course the Wogs love Luca. But, I know, yeah. but like where was I would have I was waiting to pay to see that on the big screen. Um actually I could be wrong, but I think No, nah, Onward got a theatrical release, actually, I think. Onward. Onward. I know pretty much no one saw Onward. I, I thought I it was alright. Yeah, but, I I think I watched the first half, but yeah, look, Luca and Raya yeah. and this one, I just, like, these are the yeah. ones you, you definitely want to see on the big screen. Yeah, um, so that, that's a little bit weird. Um, mm. Also, real actually, quick, I was going to say before I forget, your yeah. note on the anime um, style I think is pretty nail on the head because I remembered reading something about uh, she. Uh, she was talking about how Spirited Away is one of her, you know, biggest influences on her, mm. her work. So it's such an influential film. Yeah. Uh, so many people have, so many filmmakers have said they've been inspired by that. It's it, something about that film. It really, I haven't actually seen it to be honest, but I, a lot of people, Definitely. the way they talk about it, it is a really masterpiece. It. It's a masterpiece. Um, actually, I got to make a slight correction here. Ray and the Last Dragon was only Disney. It was not Pixar. Um, ah, right. It's getting really confusing to <laughs> it is isn't tell, it? because generally the way I used to tell is like the ones with singing are Disney, the ones without singing are Pixar. But now Disney have done a few without singing, I think. So okay, so if there's no singing, know. it is strictly Disney. Okay. No, no, no. If there's no oh. singing, it's strictly Pixar. Right. But okay, yeah, right, right. But because you know, back in the day, they had like Snow White and stuff. They always sung. But I could be wrong because I think now Disney have are starting to do films, animations without singing. Because mm. I know, did Raya have songs in it? I, I, I don't oh. recall. I don't it, think, I think it, it did. It, no, I don't think it was. It was not a musical. But you know yeah. what? I think um, Soul was the other Pixar movie that went to Disney+. Plus. That was the other uh, one. Yeah, I remember. That was the one. Because I Soul remember. Soul was so good too. It was amazing another therapy session i was not expecting um oh but that one oh my gosh i would have loved to have seen that in the cinema it was so deserving yeah also i think i just realized raya was raya i think i'm just reading here i think raya was actually i'm i haven't seen raya so mm-hmm. yeah I, I just want to fact check myself i don't think raya is chinese i think it's filipino Ooh. I could be wrong. Look, guys, I don't claim to be a <laughs> expert with everything. We're just people talking to a microphone. I come with no bad intentions. I apologize if I've made any um, racial misunderstandings. Um, I will watch Raya and educate myself. So well, it says it says it says it's set in the fictional land of Kamandra, which is inspired by the beautiful cultures of Southeast Asia. Right. So it is a fictional it's, place. Okay. I think it's so like. It's I wasn't completely wrong. Not fully, but it's. Oh, and by... Sandra O. Oh, 
Yeah. Was in this and which, right, hang on. Sandra O is in both this in Turning Red and Raya and the Last Dragon. He must clearly have a really. Good for them. Yeah, like it also, they must love her. Um, yeah. Which is totally understandable. It's just what we were saying. When Disney likes someone, they stick with them. So, yeah, 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 they do. Oh, such a good movie. Anyways, uh, I think that's it for us today here at Upcoming Attractions. Uh, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Um, we've had fun. I hope you had fun too. If you want to hear more, be sure to check us out the for an audio version at Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you would find your favorite podcasts. You can watch us live on, you can, not live, but you can watch us in full on YouTube. And be sure to check out our clips on social media, whether it be either Instagram or TikTok or wherever you like to press the like button in real life. It gets wild in the TikTok comments. It really does. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, we've had a lot of fun there. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> thanks for hanging out with us today. It's been a nice short one. I hope you've enjoyed it. Until next time, ladies. Bye, guys.